Hallo, willkommen zusammen zu unserem Meetup. Ähm, schön, dass alle da sind. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna switch to English now. Um, welcome everyone. Oh, that, oh, that was actually, uh, yeah, very funny. Okay, so welcome to our Meetup today um, about Mainframe. What the heck? Um, our guest speaker is Tobias Leicher. Welcome, Tobias. And um, Hello. I would like to know, Tobias, tell us, why are you talking about mainframe today? I mean, it's pretty seldom <laughs> to have that topic, and I'm very interested. Um, what, what makes you so curious about it? Not, not too popular these days, yes, indeed. Um, yeah, basically, I, I got interested during my studies. I, I had my first internship in an, in an area in IBM where we had um, consultancy services and stuff like that. And basically, I met one of my mentors at the time, and, and he said, yeah, and then we have this tool that automatically transforms COBOL into Java. And I was like, so how does that work? What the heck is COBOL anyway? And uh, And we had a little discussion and we never agreed on that automatic transformation would work and i still don't agree with him but um but that got me hooked and since then i always found the platform quite interesting even though the the, the majority of people don't even know it exists hopefully we can change that today a lot and uh, yeah and since then i always was was attached to it wow so i will make it short um hi everyone please um if you have any questions post them in the chat, I will monitor the chat and I'm gonna go on mute now and um, take myself back to leave the stage uh, for Tobias. So, cool. Tobias. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, good, then we start. Um, yeah, so basically the question, I forgot the question mark, what the heck? Uh, it shouldn't be a, an exclamation, it should be more a question. Most people that I meet and I, re uh, I regularly do Uh, lectures on universities and uh, and talk to people that are fresh in IT don't really know what this mainframe thing is and so we had this discussion with the with the developer advocacy team and we found that it is quite a good thing to do and so thank you Marion for having me um, let, let, let's have a look at it uh, I start with a little question oops I go to the right window it should work um, have you was so I, I have no idea who's in the room actually i mean i saw people on xing uh, joining i know some of the names in the chat already of course but i don't really know what your position is to mainframe if you have any ideas about it if you have any expectations of the sessions so please just post in the chat what what your feelings are how do you think the mainframe is uh is actually interesting to you what do you think could be could be something the session should cover so that we can actually do something that actually helps you in the end to say we had a good good session and uh didn't knew what it was so there are some uh, and please feel free german is fine as well so if you ask the question in german i will i will uh, do the automatic translation the actual operating system of the IBM mainframe. I think there's a question that uh, you want to know a little bit more about that. So I have I have some bits about that as well. That's good. That's in the presentation already. I thought mainframes are dead. <laughs> I like I like that comment, Max. Yes. Uh, Welcome. Yeah, and, and if you wonder why I look at that side, so I have two screens so that I can see the, the charts and you guys at the same time. So I'm actually looking at you even though it doesn't look like, hence I'm here. Okay, so um, if you if you want to ask, give more answers, just just post in, I will, I will have a look uh, every second machine learning on a mainframe, security concepts, Docker at CCX. Okay, special questions already, cool. So uh, we, we, we shortly have a look. And uh, the, the first I want to start, and I start most of my presentations with, uh, with, uh, with a quote. And in this, uh, in, this point, uh, in this presentation, the quote comes from Gene Amdahl. Gene Amdahl was the, the chief architect of the mainframe architecture. And uh, yeah, if, if one talks about mainframe, it's probably always a little bit of a history session. And so, um, so a, few, a few words on that. Up to the year 1964, there was no term such as architecture for computers. So basically, the mainframe was the first architecture that has been there in the IT world up to that point. Every new computer was a total new 
instruction set. So you had to, to recreate all your applications at the point. And so these guys, Gene, Jared Blau and, um, and Fred Brooks came basically up with the idea of this architecture and to build a computer that is basically following certain rules and has a, a certain architecture as it is seen by the programmer. So that is very important for, for these guys at the point in time, they wanted to make it easy for programmers. And so basically that is still what the mainframe is. And most people, when they think about it, wouldn't imagine a mainframe looking like that. I mean, I, I saw someone in the chat saying, I saw a Linux one machine. So you saw something like that, but that is basically a mainframe. So four to five, nine, uh, 19 inch uh, racks, basically in the data center. Uh, there are still versions of the mainframe where it wasn't 19 inches, but um, but the most modern ones are 19 inches, so they fit nicely into, into a data center. And they have these fancy looking doors. They win award prizes for, for design every other year, which is totally ridiculous because no one is ever is ever has ever or rarely has the chance to see these doors so actually most of the the customers should put it in their entrance under a big glass dome and say oh have a look we even have a, we have an rt piece here so um the doors are actually priced and if you look at it basically it is just a big server uh, quite a sophisticated one fair enough but generally it's just another server and when you look at it it's also there you don't see any entries for punch cards so it is of course not what what people expect when they hear mainframe this uh these machines from the from the 60s and the 70s where you had to punch punch cards and and enter them to the machine it's a quite modern server and you wouldn't actually recognize any differences so why would one work with such an outdated technology um, when you look at uh, at these these quotes, two of them basically are from the from the late '80s, early '90s, where the people thought that the mainframe is actually going away because it seemed that the new upcoming desktop PCs will basically overrule everything and and basically make the make the mainframe redundant. So you see a very well accepted uh, notion of the computing is that the mainframe is going the way of the dinosaur. Um, and Stuart Alsop, a guy who, who was at that time, I think, director of InfoWorld, um, basically predicted that in March 15, 1996, an InfoWorld reader will unplug the last mainframe. If you take that serious and you see us talking today, you probably assume this is not going to happen. So there are still mainframes around. We still, uh, we still have new machines. So probably the last of these quotes is the most interesting one, where Forrester actually stated, that in 1994, it's the end of the end of the mainframe. So basically, um, this guy, uh, that's Stuart Alsop, and uh, he was quoted. I mean, that always happens if you if you put your name up uh, up in the newspaper and do a prediction. There might be the chance that someone reads it and someone will actually take you serious and ask you then, in this case, 1996, I think was the quote, yeah, asked them in 1996 to actually eat his words. So he had to eat his words very literally and admit that he was wrong and the mainframe is still quite a reasonable machine that, that will probably last a little longer than he predicted. So just to give you some ideas about importance, um, I made this, uh, it's not a very nice chart, but at least it, it has a rough... Uh, it fits roughly the, the, the sizes of the numbers. When we look at what happens in one second, in one second, actually, I was very surprised to see, and the numbers are a little bit dated, so probably it's a lot more today. They are, I think, three, four years old, but that were the only numbers that I could find. Actually, more people are watching YouTube than people searching on Google. I was surprised about that. I was also quite surprised to see that um, Tinder actually uh, is more important these days than than um, than Facebook, and I have no numbers on TikTok. Probably they would be in the same range at the moment. But when we compare that to, uh, we have some more comments. Uh, uh, when we compare that to, for example, and that is just Kix transactions, so just one application that runs on the mainframe, we see that YouTube looks uh, fairly poor against it. So there is a lot of stuff going on every second on mainframes, and if something happens on mainframes, it probably also touches you in your everyday life. And uh, what this is, we will see later on in the presentation, just to give you some scale. So it is actually quite a heavy use technology that none of you ever notice. So 
why does everything seems to be so strange with mainframes? I mean, if you if you try to Google stuff, you find very strange words. You see that people IPL the processor or they do stuff with the CAC. And you always wonder what the heck is that? And if you even work in a company where they have mainframes, uh, I assume that could be also a reason why you are around. Um, you, you maybe always be very puzzled when they talk about it because they use very strange words if you want to call them words probably just abbreviations most of them three to four letters ibm is very great at them and we developed quite a lot of these and so um so so there are plenty of these around and they always talk about strange things so for example i said they ipl the machine when they say ipl this basically means booten uh, to, to boot up a machine and the thing with mainframes is when they were invented in the 60s, there was not really much marketing around. So basically most of the things are called for what they are. So when they say they IPL a machine, they basically do an initial program load. So the first load of a program that was ever done on a machine, which is probably the operating system, is the IPL. So the, the same holds true for most of the other abbreviations that we will face today. We will uncover them one by one, or at least a bunch of them. We will not reach all of them. There is actually even a, a dictionary with IBM abbreviations and what they mean in, in, in real life. And most of these abbreviations basically are in the area of mainframe computing. And uh, oh yeah, that was just a sample for me. Uh, th there are some very archaic words. And also you see, if you see the number of, of arrows here, most of these, I think you see my mouse, I have to check. Yes, I think you see that, brilliant. Uh, a lot of these actually refer to the same thing. So in this case, the term CPU, CAC, system, processor, machine, all means the big box. So when we go back to the to the to the look of the mainframe, basically this is what they call a CAC, a machine, a CPU. And you wonder then and say, oh, a CPU, isn't that not just the the the, the actual processor? But at that time, a central processing unit may might be also just a full box. So that is unfortunate that the mainframers still use these terms that were quite reasonable at the time. But you also see that they call also the processes itself sometimes CPUs, so it gets confusing. Unfortunately, they always say we were the first ones, so we keep using these terms as they are more accurate. That sometimes is, is not really helpful. When we now look into these machines, oops, Sorry, what happens when you open these doors? Actually, what happens when you open the doors at the front side, you will just see a bunch of air cooling because um, the front side is actually just cooled. And if you look at the back side, you will see this machine over here. And there's a link down here. And this link basically can be clicked. And then you will end up with a 3D animation of these, of these things. I didn't try to do that live because normally when you try to do that live over a webcast, it is very very cluttered and you don't want to have that. But if you if you look at this box, this is the same four, four, uh, four rack machine as we've seen before. You see different things. You see, for example, the cooling that is down here. These are the, 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 the points you see from the from the website when where I took the screenshots from. You can actually click at them and it will explain to you what, what, what's in there. So down here we have the cooling. And you may wonder that you see everything a little bit twice. So you see this, these machines over here twice. You see most of the things twice. And that's basically a very important thing with mainframes. They are incredibly reliable. So they were built to actually survive a lot of things. And um, the most fancy one, uh, I didn't look up the video, but uh, if you Google mainframe Japan and uh, and um, earthquake, you quickly get a video where actually a mainframe is in a building and the, the whole data center is very, very much chaotic, but the mainframe is still running, even though a big earthquake did happen. And that is basically due to the fact that everything is in the mainframe twice. Not everything, every little Piece, but most of the functional components are there twice. So you have basically two power plugs where you where uh, two two power sockets where you actually plug in your the power for your machine so that one dies and in the best case they are also different circuits so you don't you don't actually kill both of them at the same time. But but everything is there twice and that is also true when we look into the machines itself when you look these drawers as we call them so you can 
took them out as a uh, take them out as a draw. These drawers basically contain the actual CPUs, the processor cores, and the memory. And you may wonder if the, there are just five of the processors, what is all the rest? Most of the rest is just I/O cards, or they are special cards. For example, when you when you have to work with crypto stuff, there are cryptographical cards that store the keys, and they store them even tamper-proof. So if you actually get into the data center and want to steal the keys physically and you try to rip them off, basically the keys would destroy themselves. So a very, very secure machine and a lot of fancy stuff going on. But the, the CPUs, so the actual processor cores, they look a little bit like that. And if you look into these guys, you see there's the memory over here. And this memory is also not just normal memory, it's actually RAM memory. So you, you may, see a certain similarity to rates which you probably already heard so rates are, are arrays of disks rams are, are arrays of memory and so even if one of these memory slots actually fail we can recover the, the information that has been there so that there is no data loss same holds true for most of the the, the cpu functionality so even a lot of the the information be, is shared between the different processor cores so we have a level four cache that is something we don't really see often with uh, with normal cpus because in the intel world it's not very common but it is a shared cache across all the different the different processors to actually share information on a on a cache level not just on the memory level and then you of course get some cooling and some stuff in here and some io funds of course but it is it is quite impressive. So when you look at it, it has it has roughly 190 processing cores. I, when I say roughly, I just mean it is not exactly 190. It's actually even more because the machine has something like spare processors. So if one of these processors fail and the machine detects it, it will automatically enable a spare processor core. So there are other cores actually enabled if, if one is broken, for example, because a photon runs through it and destroyed inner circuits and stuff. So, so it is automatically repaired. So the machine is still up and running. Same is true, of course, for the memory, as I said before. And uh, here we have 50 terabytes of, of RAM that we can actually use. So we have even more physical RAM in there as we had with the processor cores. And plenty of these PCIe fan outs, so we can have lots of IO cards. And now when we look at the, uh, the performance stuff that we see, we notice that there is actually a curve that goes down again. That is something that people don't actually like because we expect everything to go up and more and fancier. But if we look at it and 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 check out what it actually says, it is basically talking about the the, the frequency of the the machine itself. So in this case, we have actually a downfall from 5.5 gigahertz, which we have in the EC12, which we had in the EC12 to 5.2 gigahertz today. But still we see that other curve that is actually actually moving up. And this is actually the capacity of the machine. So gigahertz always were a very shitty way to, to ask about performance of a machine, but uh, it was the, the thing that, uh, that, that was used mostly. So when I was young, I remember that every new MediaMark prospect and every new new computer magazine talked about the next gigahertz barrier that we crossed or the next in the beginning it was the megahertz but uh, then it was later on gigahertz and and everyone talked about gigahertz as if it was the, the a term for capacity of computing today we know that's not true um most of the 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 the, the pcs today don't even tell you how much gigahertz they have they usually talk about other numbers and people are very good with numbers so intel came up with i3 i5 i7 again we know the bigger numbers are the better to actually replace the gigahertz thing because today most of the the processors have a far lower frequency than they used to have so why is that why don't we just go up and up and up it is basically because you see the the um the, the sockets are made in a 40 nanometer way and if we put more frequency on it it will actually have more power in it and more heat and that will be very hard to actually uh, get off the, the the processors so we see we have quite a good uh, good story here um, we are actually growing capacity from every machine to every machine and we see the chips itself got very interesting cap uh, capabilities um, we have a very optimized out of order execution 
with the machine. Uh, we, we came a little bit late with the topic of SMT, but we have quite good SIMD functionality, single instruction, multiple data, so-called vector instructions, so that you, for example, can actually do a, a calculation, not just on a single number, but on a bunch of numbers at the same time. And you can imagine vector um, operands are very good, uh, vector operations are very, very good for strings because strings basically very often have these compare things and do stuff with strings. So that is very helpful here as well. So the machines are going quite well. And one of the things why we are growing the machine, even though we don't hire the, the frequency, is that we do a very balanced system design. So it's not just about the number of processor cores that we have. It is also about the memory that we can address, the bandwidth that we have in I.O. You will see that, that I.O. is a very critical thing for mainframes. They have to do a lot of um, a lot of I.O. operations because when a mainframe is heavily used, it is mostly used to over 90% of, of, um, of the capacity it has. So it has to actually interact a lot with the data facilities that we have. And that's the same true, of course, for the PCIe to actually make a uh, connection to the outside world. And you see this is basically growing in a, in a very, let's say, uh, natural way. So things are growing on each side. And that is why we are even getting better and better with the CPUs, even though we don't change much. So from the, from the last, which is the Z14 chip to the Z15 chip, we didn't even change the, the manufacturing size. So before you see, we actually make, made the chips smaller and smaller and smaller. Of course, we are now with 40 nanometers going close to an issue when it comes to physics. So if we make it much, much smaller, then there the, the, the space between uh, in the transistors between the electrons that are actually moving is very small. So we get actually field effects that, that electrons are actually moving where they shouldn't. So there, there is a natural border, but at the moment we are still on our way to even uh, use smaller manufacturing technologies. And when we look at it, we see that the caches are very, very large. Uh, and I saw a, a comment from a comment from Mark Cook in the in the chat that the, the, the level, four ca level four caches are very great for Java. And that's indeed true, uh, especially when we have larger Java applications that have to share a lot of data in different processing cores because we have a multi-threaded application because the JVM decides it, it makes sense to actually multi-thread stuff. And this is really a, a performance key aspect of the, of the machine. When we then look at what is running on such a machine, you see again a bunch of new abbreviations. So you, you can't leave this uh, this session without understanding that there are tons of abbreviations that everyone talks about. And one of the important ones, and if you, if you talk to a mainframe and want to be cool, there are certain things where you can actually make him happy. So if you talk, for example, at the, the the, the level the level one hypervisor it is not called prsm it's called prism so if you say prism the main framer will already say ooh that's a guy who knows his stuff so um prism basically the oh uh, max uh, had a very interesting question that actually belongs to that so i go back to that is there meltdown and specter i say one thing Unfortunately, IBM decided in the 1970s, together with all the customers, that there is no public talk about, um, about issues with our software and hardware. The, the reason why they decided, and I talked to some of the guys that have been in the room in the, when it was decided in the 1970s, and basically their assumption is that we say, if we leave the door open from our car, we wouldn't put into uh, in it a, a banner that says this car is not closed. So there is a reason that we don't talk about it, but let me just generally say, um, basically Meltdown Inspector made use of out of order instruction management within the CPUs. So there might be some problems. So if you, for example, look in the Linux kernel patches for the, for the mainframe machine, you might see that there have been some patches. I don't know. I wouldn't be able to talk about it, but it might have happened. And maybe you already see that it was fixed the same way as on other machines, maybe even better because we have still the same performance metrics, but I can't actually comment that. <laughs> there was another question about KISC and RISC. For those of you uh, in the chat who, um, who knows the, the difference. So in this case, it's about the reduced instruction set and complex instruction set. 
Um, and the, the mainframe architecture actually is a complex instruction set machine. It has up to 1,500 instructions at the moment. Um, is there a plan to go to risk? I don't think we have a we have a plan to do that. So generally, we live very happy in the mainframe architecture with all of these uh, instructions, and it's very hard to change them because we have 1,500 instructions. And if I had a program that was written in 1964, it would even run today because the mainframe hardware itself and the mainframe architecture was always backward compatible. So the architecture that was invented in 1964 was done that nicely that we can still use it today. Of course, we added since then, I think the first, and I actually have an original brochure here in my, in my, in my, in my home office, but I think the first machine had around 70 uh, instructions, maybe even less. And so we, we grew factors from there, but we still lose the same, uh, use the same instructions. If we would change that to a risk architecture, that would actually mean all of this uh, backwards compatibility would be gone. So there is no actual intention to change that architecture itself. Of course, never say never. I mean, we, we, we never know what happens, but at the moment there, there would be, it wouldn't be very sensible to do so. But of course, what the, what the IBM systems tend to do since a, since a good while is to actually have special facilities for special issues in the machine. And with that, it is maybe sometimes the case that we can actually use a, a, a facility within the chip that is then actually having a different architecture. But that would then be all hidden from the, from the developer itself and it would be part of the chip. So no directly go to there. Um, back to that. So we have PRISM, which is the, 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 the type one hypervisor that actually in la allows different L paths to, uh, to, be, to be run on the system. And we see in this case, there are a ZOS L path. ZOS is one of the operating systems, and I will come to that in a little bit, uh, with some applications running on it. Then we have a ZVM L path. ZVM is basically the VMware of the mainframe. It's, uh, it's been around quite a lot longer than, Z uh, than VMware, of course. So this is around since the 70s. So this is a hypervisor, a type two hypervisor that actually hosts different gas systems. In this case, also a lot of ZOSs. Here we have a ZVM that hosts some Linuxes, a KVM that hosts some Linuxes. So also KVM is, is, is possible as a, as a second level hypervisor and uh, also, Linux on Z can run natively as it can ZOS on the machine. And you see down here, there's plenty of physical resources. So most of these of these resources that are actually around will be virtually dedicated to one of these devices. You can actually have a, a, a complete dedication that CP1, for example, is only used for this LPA1, but it is it is uh, quite a complex thing and most of the customers share of course resources between different machines because in the end that is how they reach actually the 90 to 100 percent uh, usage of the machine itself and we can have hundreds and thousands of of these uh, machines running in the in the, in the second level hypervisor like cvm so it is not that we just run 10 or 12 of these virtual machines we can actually run thousands of it and customers are actually do, do that now we come to the operating systems itself. Oh, there was a question. Do the installed base grew up in the last years? Uh, that's a very uh, interesting question because it's very hard to answer. And that's a typical IBM answer. It depends. It depends on what you look at. If you look at customers that actually buy mainframes, they are actually uh, uh, not a growing number. And the opposite, especially when we look at Europe, it's actually a shrinking number. But the reason why they shrink is not just because people don't use mainframes anymore. The reason why they shrink mostly is that uh, a lot of companies actually merge. So when we look at the Volks- and Raiffeisenbanken here in Germany and the, the, the Sparkassen, most of these, of these banks actually had their own data centers a while ago. And meanwhile, both of these companies share a single data center. Uh, the, both of these banks have their single data center. So there's a single data center for the Sparkassen and a single data center or a provider. It's not just a single data center. Of course, there are two of them and high availability and all of this, but um, there's just a single IT provider. So they have to use, or they, they are able to actually use far, far less mainframes than they had to use in the, 
in the old times. So we get generally have a, a shrinking number of people that use mainframes as the companies are actually merging. But when you look at the actual consumed CPU, it goes up massively. And it is, there's yes? also been a question in the uh, question section, um, if you oh. could explain what CICS is. I people. will actually. Oh, thank you. I didn't open that, so I didn't no see problem. that. Uh, thank, thank you, Max. Um, we will actually have a, 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 a little section about that in a, in, a, in a short while. Just for the moment, it's basically an app server, but we will come to some details later on. Thanks for that question. So generally, the installation base grows consumption-wise, but not with the number of clients. Even though we have very big clients in... Um, in countries like China, where in a very short amount of time, very big banks started to serve millions of people. And that is a situation that we don't see very often in the world, maybe in India as well, and uh, maybe somewhere in also in Africa. But uh, but most of the, the, the countries that are that using mainframes already, they have quite this effect of merging instead of actually growing up numbers. So when we look at the operating systems, there are actually three very traditional ones. The first one is ZOS. That was at a time when they had System 360. That was the name of the, the first mainframe in the world. When they had that, they said ZOS is basically the, the System 360 operating system. And that was the most disastrous um, software project that you can imagine at the time because they thought, oh, whoa, 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 we have to build everything into it and they run behind schedule all the time. So they decided, if we can't make it with that much people, let's put in more people. And so they put in more and more and more people. And um, this, of course, didn't solve the problem. I quickly had a look if I can find my book, because uh, the guy, which is named Fred Brooks, he actually wrote a book afterwards, and he called it The Mythical Man Month. And it was called like that because he actually debunked the idea that more people will actually help in the, in these kinds of situation because if you add more people the the overhead of communication is actually getting more so basically the problem in in project management we we will probably have the the sample of nine women can't get a baby in one month and that is the same is true for software so zos was actually a big a bit of a troubled project at the time and when they finished it, they figured out, oops, for the smallest physical machines that they built, it, it was too big. So we can't load it on it. And there was actually a second operating system. At that time, it was called DOS, Disk Operating System. Today, it's called VSE. It's just a smaller version of the operating system, not as functional as the ZOS operating system. And that is still around and still used with many smaller customers uh, also here in Germany and in, in the rest of Europe. Then we had ZVM, which is the hypervisor. We already talked about that. That is around. And then we have one more system that you have probably never heard of, which is called TPF. This is just an operating system that was built for high transaction companies, like um, like um, like companies that, uh, that do the, the, the support for the airlines and stuff. So TPF is basically just an operating system that does transactions. And then we have Linux on Z, which is the same Linux on Z as every other machine. Oh, go on. When we started IT, there was basically just, as I said before, punch cards to interact with these, with these mainframes. And that is when we also invented the term batch job. As I said before, at that time, people weren't very creative. So batch just meant you run with your batch of cards to the machine and let it process it. But that, of course, was quite a, an annoying thing to do because you need to actually queue up. So you need to stand in queues. And if you are just a student, then you probably never get your time on the machine because you only get it at night times when no one else is working on it. So that's a bit annoying. So people prefer online transactions. And if we look at it, batch is basically scheduled for a certain point in time. With the input, we also give the, the bunch of data that we actually want to, to, to <coughs> want to run through, and the output is typically delayed. On the other side, the online transaction systems are more getting a, a real answer at the, at the point in time, and the input is immediate. So we have immediate input, immediate output, because we actually supply it with it, and that's more like we work with computers today. 
Linux is the only for among Z operating systems. The rest are proprietary. Yes, that's true. So when I look at that that number, Linux is actually free, and the Linux kernel can run on 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 the machine for free, and it's open source. Most of the others are closed source. There are older versions of the operating systems that are still around in the internet. I think MVS, the first version of XA, I think is open source. Meanwhile, but um, but the 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 two days operation systems are all proprietary. And when we then look at the system itself, it basically looks like that. So ZOS, the, the, the operating system, same is true for, for VSE, has some of the services that we would expect. So there's a workload management going on in the system. We would call it a dispatcher in, in Unix and Windows terms. There are some crypto services. As I said before, there's a very, very uh, efficient crypto hardware in it. So there's a bunch of this stuff going on. We have job output. When we say job, this basically means a job, a task, a process that runs. Of course, we want to get some output of it. So we want to have a log management. This is basically done with the job system and uh, the job management system. We have to do maintenance on software. We have to do networking, storage management. And we see some very fancy bits here. It's called Unix system services. So basically at one point in time when Unix became very fancy, people at IBM thought, why wouldn't we just reuse a lot of the stuff that the Unix guys did? And so they enhanced the ZOS operating system with another inter set of interfaces that end up in the same operating system kernel, but it looks like very Unix-ish. And we will see that in a bit. We have different types of data sources. vSAM isn't really a database, even though the picture implies that, but IMS is. And now IMS, again, you wonder what does that mean? And of course, you can imagine that it is a very stupid name. In this case, it's the information management system. And the IMS guys always say, we are on, we, were, we have been on the moon. Uh, that's not completely true. Actually, they just have built it. Uh, they just have helped to build the, the Apollo rockets. So they haven't been themselves on the moon, but they actually helped a lot to do so. And uh, DB2, which is a relational database, someone wants to have a guess in the chat why it is called DB2. No one? It's a very simple reason because it was a second database after IMS. And IMS has been the first database, so they called the second database just DB2. As said, at that time, people were not very uh, fancy with their, with their, with their naming. <laughs> And DB3 yeah, might be still under development. I'm not sure if we ever see that. So th th these jokes only work once. <laughs> and uh, when we now look at the stuff up here, that's basically the, the application side of things. So we have transaction managers that actually serve transactions. We have, these are kicks and also IMS. IMS is kind of an overloaded term. IMS exists once as a database and once as a, as a data control mechanism. We have JEE servers, we have security managers like, uh, predecessor of LDAP, which is called RACF. Uh, we have development systems, of course, and we have monitoring. And now we look into a few of these things. So I said the databases, DB2 has been around since the late 70s, early, early 80s. Um, IMS has been much older. IMS is more hier hierarchical database, a navigational database. Um, before there has been stuff like EDMS, which is uh, IDMS, which is the, the the first network database, the first database that has been around at the time, and uh, then IMS came around, and later on DB2, and basically then a lot of development happened, and a lot of databases are around, and you can of course run all all of them as well on the mainframe, especially in the Linux side of things, you can run all the the NoSQL databases as you would in any other Linux, because the Linux operating system um, that we talked about is the same operating system as any other operating system. Of course, it has some specifics in the kernel, but the specifics are around, I think, under 2% of the, of the code of the kernel is specific to IBM Z. So most of it is very normal, same behavior, but the programs, of course, need to be compiled on the Z architecture because we have like 1,500 instructions. Intel has a uh, has a a lot fewer than that, and so we need to recompile applications. And then I have a little quote for you uh, of a person that said, "I make fun of a lot of other databases. All other databases, in fact, except of the mainframe version of DB2, it's a first piece, uh, first rate piece of technology." Want to have another try on who said that?
I give you a few seconds. Um, probably most of you will know the name, so it's not a not a very unpopular. Uh, popular is probably the wrong word. It's not a very unfamous person. <laughs> Popularity of that person might depend on uh, on who you ask. It was Larry Ellison, the CEO and uh, founder of, of Oracle. Oops, and I forgot to translate that. That means founder and CEO, CEO of Oracle. So uh, Larry Ellison actually said that in his life twice. So he even repeated the statement that DB2 on Z is actually quite a good piece of technology. But um, he, of course, in the second time said, of course, it's not as good as, as Oracle. But uh, you see, it quite has some reputation. And when we look at it, why is DB2 on Z a little bit special? Of course, it's a relational database. When you're a developer and you develop your Java code against DB2 on Z, you would probably not even notice that it is running on Z because it's just a normal SQL database. But when you look at the technology behind it, what it can do, it can actually do something that is called data sharing. And you see a little, a little clock over here. And this clock is basically a, a so-called sysplex timer. And this is very important. When you when you do shared computing or you do actually um, distributed computing, you need to agree on a time. And this is done on mainframes with a so-called sysplex timer. So in a sysplex, which is more than one ZOS instance, all of these machines agree on a certain time. And so it is possible to run different subsystems on different machines in different locations. But all of these machines actually ride on shared disks. So they can manage locks and logs also locks with CK and locks with G shared over this whole environment. And that is very special because if you imagine you would shoot down one of these data centers, all of the rest would just go on working and don't even notice that that one data center has gone down. So this is a very special technology in in uh, in with uh, with DB2 and it is very fancy and helps a lot of customers to maintain a state over several data centers. When we now look at the transactions and the applications itself, you see here, by the way, a green screen, um, which is which is what most people think of when they talk about mainframe. Most people working on mainframes don't even see them, but they still think it's there. Uh, when we look at the applications, basically we agree that there's hardware, there's an operating system, there's some communication, there's a database. And then at the time, when nothing else was around, people had to think of a lot of things. So that when they want to build an application, they had to think of the business logic itself, but they also had to think of locking administration and all of these things, multi-threading and stuff. And so they basically came to the idea to say, let's sort out that application bit and make this, this facility stuff that is running in between a so-called application server today. At the time, we called it the transaction server it would equally translate to an application server. And the cool thing with Kix now in this case is, same is true for IMS. So the IMS DC part, which is not the, the database, but the, the data control part can do the same thing. And it allows you basically to run applications at the same time on the machine that serves hundreds and thousands of customers. So when we look at, at what this basically is, it is just another program running on this physical machine. And this kicks thing basically runs several tasks at the same time. And at that time, it was very, very crazy to do so because people didn't were used to that idea of multi-threading. And they run it on the same machine as any other stuff. Basically, same technology as on our PCs. When we talk about a program that runs a process, a task, a threat, um, or a, an address space, as it is called on the, on the mainframe side. Basically, that is just a, a bunch of memory that the application sings, starts with the, with, the, with the address zero, and it can make use of most of this, and then it is dispatched. And uh, dispatching things, as we call it in Unix processes or threads or whatever, are on mainframes called TCBs, task control blocks. And this is probably the most technical slide you will see in this, in this deck. And when we now talk about the application server itself, it comes with a bunch of things. It has interfaces to the outside world, a very old one, a traditional one at 3270. Another one could be web services, a web page, whatever is the interface to the outside world, maybe also an API to, to be programmed against. It has a bunch of services, stuff like asset criteria so that you can actually manage transactions and um, and units of work. It has uh, services against security so that you don't need to, to manage your own 
uh, your own um, your own security interfaces and stuff like that. So all of this is there. And of course, you have to write your own programs. You might do that in a, in a language called Assembler. This should look like an Assembler that you are used to on your, on your x86 machine. But Mainframe Assembler, of course, has a, a lot of instructions. As I said before, 1,500 or something, maybe even more with the new C15 machine. And that's quite a bunch of uh, instructions to know of. I know very few people that can make use of at least half of them. So most of the people don't really know what it is about. But of course, you can uh, you can uh, use that in in higher level languages that I would come to. Uh, there was a question. Ah, you just answered yourself <laughs> the, the the kicks question. Thank you. So uh, um, assembler is one. And people would say, if you talk to old mainframers, they would uh, actually reference you to the principles of operation, which is a very technical documentation, but has nothing to do with a book for human beings. It's more a, a technical documentation for machines. You would rather use more modern languages like COBOL. Um, and COBOL these days is not really modern. At that time, it was. Um, COBOL looks like an English book. It's not very hard to program. And I always say to my students, please don't go to your to the people that you want to work for and tell them you can't program COBOL. You have to do Java because COBOL is too complex. As you see, COBOL is not complex at all. COBOL is a bit annoying with formatting and some very strange rules, but generally everyone can develop COBOL code. So every developer that has an understanding of development and programming can develop COBOL code. It's not very hard. It's a little bit annoying sometimes, and it doesn't have the most fanciest libraries and stuff. But in the end, the question is, what do you do in your real professional life? Most of the times is you add stuff, you subtract stuff, you multiply stuff, and sometimes you also divide stuff. But that's it. I mean, if you look at what IT for banking does, in the end, it will boils down to that. Of course, it's much more complex and there are things around it, but that is what it comes down to the end. It was invented, by the way, by a, by a, by a woman called Grace Hopper. Generally, women appreciate far uh, get far too less appreciation, especially in the early days of computing. A lot of women actually made very important stuff, and it just happened in the 80s. I have when I researched stuff when when computing became a, a gaming thing that that women actually were 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 left behind. But generally, there were plenty of women in technology, and especially in when you work with mainframe customers, you see that still. Because most of the people that worked with computers at the time were the ladies, the secretaries that actually worked before with the paperwork and did the calculations. So the human calculators and the banks that actually did the math calculations, they worked first with uh, with with computers. Uh, nice movie at the moment at Netflix. I think you can see Hidden Figures, which demonstrates that very, very nicely. PL1 was then another programming language that... Um, that uh, that the I IBM came up with because at that time there was COBOL was for the business development and there was um, there was uh, oh what is happening I forgot the name uh, there <laughs> will come to me uh, there was another language used for for the for the um, for the more academic stuff will come to me in a second Fortran of course I'm very sorry Fortran for the academic bit. Need to drink a little bit, and then um, then IBM thought, oh, that's annoying having two languages. So we just invite the, um, the 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 single programming language that everyone can use, and this was the programming language one PL one. It looks very much like C, and uh, basically it was a little bit before C, but it looks more like a proper programming language to most people than COBOL does, because COBOL lo really looks like an English book. PL one actually looks like a programming language. Of course, we support C, we support C++, and we also support Java. And the most important thing when you work on mainframes is that you can actually combine all of these languages. And that's a very cool thing about, about application monitors like Kix. Kix is not just an app server for Java, as most app servers like, like WebSphere and, um, and JBoss and so are. Kix is actually an application server that can glue all of these languages together. So you can have old bits of the application that still run in COBOL, but you can have new bits that run in Java and they interact as if it was, was one runtime. That is very cool. It makes use of some shared 
shared storage for this. So basically a shared memory for this. So it's called com area or channel and container. It's quite a cool piece of technology. So as we just have 10 minutes left, um, how does a mainframe look like when I work with it? Because we, we, we haven't talked about that yet. Basically, when you log into your mainframe, it looks like that. Uh, I stole that picture off the internet because I wanted to do uh, some, some screenshots on my own today. But then I figured out that my VPN certificate was run out of date. So I have just internet screenshots, but it looks exactly like that. So you can log in with your user ID and with your password. There are some things that people know about when they really know mainframes, but generally you would just ignore all of the other bits. And then you log in and then it looks like this. You are logged into some machine, um, in this case to some IBM internal machine. And that's it. You basically end up with a screen like you did in DOS before. Uh, in the, the Microsoft DOS, you just have a you have an input for your screen. And then you would start a program which is called ISPF, the Integrated Service Facility and Programming Facility that looks then like this. And here you have another cool thing when you talk to mainframers and you want to show them that you understood understand at least a little bit. If you want to look at files, you would put in three point four that would actually get you into the utilities program and then into the file listing program that is the 3.4 command and uh, if you do that you can for example look into the bibule source files and then have a look at these files i talked to you before that there is also um a USS version, a Unix system services thing in in main in in the ZOS operating system, and when you look at this, it looks like this. It generally looks like a Linux system, but of course, it's just a Unix. You will notice that very quickly. Some of the very loved and uh, and liked things in Uni in modern Unixes and and Linuxes are not there by default, so you have to install some some other bits. But this is basically a Unix front end for you, and it has Unix. Uh, callable services that you can also use for development. But also a mainframe looks like this. So in the first piece, you might think, oh, it's still a black and white screen. That's just because everyone loves dark mode these days. So the past 10 years, I explained everyone why black and white, uh, black and green screens are not necessary anymore. These days, everyone wants to have black and green screens, but they want to have other colors as well. And they want for sure have a higher resolution as the, the mainframe one. And here we basically see a code ready workspace. This is some COBOL code that is developed in a code ready workspace. So basically an online version of VS code. And we see all the fancy bits we can actually have here. Uh, we, we see a copy book, which is basically a variable definition, something like a header file in, in, in C. And then when we, when we hover over it, it will basically tell us uh, the, the definition of it. I see there's a question. What about CDPT, ZPDT in a more affordable way? Um, I will I will try to answer that at the end. Um, it, it is a very good question, and I will come back to that one. Um, so this is this is one way to look at it, but you can also, of course, use a, a, an Eclipse version of your of your of your development environment, whatever you prefer. So these days, a lot of people dislike Eclipse because of it's let's say it's a very fat um, fat uh, footprint in the system but you can use vs code as well but if you are a, a people that a person that loves eclipse uh, eclipse is around and we we still have plenty of eclipse tooling there and you can develop in there so basically when you are now a developer and you want to develop and your shop basically introduced a, a quite modern source code development system you can run you can develop COBOL code without ever touching 30 to 70 screens. And you basically can also um, build and deploy your stuff without checking your, your, your 30 to 70, because you can use an, a build and deployment system with Jenkins and, uh, and DBB, which is a dependency-based build on ZOS, without even noticing that you are in 30 to 70. So basically, you could now ask, uh, we talked now 45 minutes or, or let's say 50 minutes about old stuff. So is the mainframe just old stuff? And it, it, is a, it, is, it is hard to answer that because of course it is a bunch of traditional applications that has been around for 50 years. And when you, when you listened at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a, there was a governor of uh, New Jersey who was complaining about this old COBOL languages that he still has around. So he meant, of course, COBOL programs that he has around. And he was complaining how it could happen that these applications are still around. And basically the reason why they are still around is that they work 
perfectly for the last 40 years. So there was not much reason to actually change them and to replace them with more modern programming languages without any benefit. Because if you develop the same thing in Java and you develop it tomorrow in Node.js, it will be the same application. It probably will do the same thing. It is just a different flavor of the programming language. So of course we have plenty of historical applications that still fulfill perfect work. So when you use your banking cards with your with your with your bank and you are with one of the major banks, you will always use mainframes. When you use credit cards, you will always use mainframes. And most of these developments are still done in COBOL. So um why, why would you change that? Why would you change an existing application that is doing perfectly fine and that just has a out of date, not in fashion programming language anymore? But of course, there is no reason why you would limit yourself to that. So when we look forward five more years, why is IBM Z still kicking? IBM Z allows you to encrypt everything. You can encrypt data at rest, you can encrypt data in flight, you can even encrypt data that is in memory sometimes when you want to, for example, send a dump to IBM. We can do cloud native provisioning. So why wouldn't there be a button to say, please give me a DB2 table on ZOS? There's no reason why we can't automate that and make it cloud-like. We can have highest performance for application because as you saw, it is still a very, very capable single thread performance in this machine. But what we need to do and what we work on with our customers is to streamline the processes. We need to address skills issues where people actually build a software and were responsible for it for 40 years and then going to retire. Even if that application would have been written in the most modern language uh, like Rust, Go, you name it, it would still be a very complex issue. And so the, the application is complex and we need to have a, a look at the skills. And therefore we need, by the way, a lot of young people that are interested in mainframes. And hopefully I could convince you here that there is no magic behind it. It's all technology. It's all something you can learn. And it is something that very few people want to learn. So there is a high market for it. And of course we need to integrate the existing and the, the, um, the future applications. We never do that alone. We always do that with plenty of customers. So every new mainframe machine is that is, is actually developed with, with, with a bunch of people from different customers. They take different personas there. So it is never an IBM only thing. And basically the, the thing that we want to achieve is that a mainframe become the same target operating model. So you develop, a, you actually maintain it in an SRE way of things. You actually use DevOps to develop application. You can use Kubernetes and OpenShift on the platform together with your existing ZUS bits. You can use CICD development pipelines when you are a developer, you don't actually need to understand that in the end there will be a mainframe. Of course, you will wonder when you develop COBOL code if there is ever another uh, another platform than than mainframes to do that. But you can do that. Um, you can use Git and use Git and Jenkins. We have even quantum proof algorithms for our encryption stuff, and we we try to do more AI acceleration in the machine and. A bunch of more stuff will come up in, and I already saw that uh, that it was advertised. There is a uh, there is a, a next topic uh, where we talk more about enterprise architectures, and uh, I will I will actually go into more details of the future in there. Tobias, there has also been a question about uh, uh, what about Z PDT in a more affordable way. Yes, um, I, I saw that. I, I come to that uh, at the very end because it's it's a, it's a half happy story. So. Uh, just one more slide, and then we then we we come to that. When when we look at our technology stack at the moment, we see OpenShift takes quite a central role in that, and we have existing Linux and Unix systems. We have some very special systems like Tandem systems and so on, and we have ZOS there. But we see that OpenShift becomes kind of the the target operational model. So people like to operate their IT in a very Kubernetes style of fashion, and ZOS is very well equipped for that. We actually are able to 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 develop, for example example, on DB2 databases or ZOS applications in OpenShift. And we use even an OpenShift IDE for it with code ready workspaces. So it's quite a fancy thing. And in the end, the mainframe becomes just another supporter of this hybrid cloud platform. And as said, we will come into that a little bit later, but I just 
want to give you this idea uh, in, in this other podcast, uh, in this other webcast, but I want to give you an idea. It's not just about the old stuff if you don't, if you don't join for the next, uh, for the next session. And now just shortly for the, for the question about ZPDT. So for all the others that are wondering what is ZPDT, uh, ZPDT is basically just an emulator of the mainframe hardware architecture on your x86 machine, maybe in the future also on your ARM machine as uh, more and more also desktop uh, systems now starting with Apple decided to actually run their own, their own architecture with ARM. Um, and it basically is an emulator as said, and it allows you to run a ZOS operating system on your, on your own machine. There is now a very personal opinion, and my personal opinion is every developer should have access to ZOS systems uh, to do that. They don't need to maintain ZPDT on their own because that can be annoying, especially when you are new to the system and you need to IPL a ZOS system, that can be annoying. But I would actually vote for, for this access. And we are doing better and better. So there are now actually availability of, of test machines in the, um, in, the, uh, in the public cloud. But the ZBDT pricing, it's still an issue that is hard to solve. Let me say it like that. Uh, another question about, can you certify yourself? Yes, you can. There are plenty of certification when it comes to the, um, to the operating system. You can certify yourself. You can certify yourself for DB2 on ZOS. You can certify yourself for Kix on ZOS. Uh, there are plenty of, uh, of certifications. Um, some of them sometimes are also free when you go to conferences, to IBM conferences, you can even do them for free. Some of them actually cost you money. Um, there are also regularly programs where the, the Z community allows you to do that. Uh, sadly, I just joined, indeed. <laughs> That's indeed said for us as well. Uh, will there be a recording available after the sessions? I think so. Isn't it, Marion? Yes, she already replied yes. Yes. yes, there will be a recording directly under that link. On the same link as the event, there will be a recording posted, I think, shortly after the session. Are there other questions? Now's your time. I, I, I already consumed one minute and a half more than I was allowed to. But uh, if you are interested, of course, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, if you want to join for the other meeting, uh, the other web, uh, the other webcast, it will be more focusing on the, let's say, more recent development in enterprise architecture and how to actually do all of this. So if you now understand what a mainframe is, you might want to see how can you actually put your, your knowledge about modern systems together with mainframes into something new. So feel free to join. And uh, otherwise, thank you for your, for your time. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tobias, for for that really um, uh, fantastic hour. It was really uh, awesome to listen to you to talk uh, about mainframes. Um, for everyone else um, who is also interested in Kobo, I think under developer.ibm.com there's a lot of uh, uh, input for that too. And uh, I'm really looking forward um, to welcome you on your next session, Tobias, and um, I see uh, people are dropping out now. I haven't seen another question. Let me see. There was one, how to get access to uh, the ZPDNT. Do you see there is my email address. You can send me, uh, you can send me an email. There are some things like public cloud access for, for, for people that are still in universities. So, so we can probably figure something out. All right, then. Uh, thank you again so much, Tobias. <laughs> no worries. It's been a pleasure. Was happy. Um, I'm going to end the broadcast now so everyone is uh, prepared. Goodbye. Good. I wish you a nice evening um, or morning or wherever you're located. So have a good rest Thanks of a the lot. day. Bye-bye. Cheers.